The opinions and views expressed by the participants during this broadcast do not reflect nor represent Service of Christ Ministries Incorporated. Praise the Lord, saints, and welcome to the Gospel Truth. Welcome, welcome to the Gospel Truth. Uh, we are happy and proud to have you here with us today. I am Pastor Jerry Jones, uh, Pastor of Servants for Christ uh, Baptist Church. I have with us our uh, assistant to the pastor, Reverend Harry E. Lundy. We are happy to invite you to join us today for the Gospel Truth, which comes to you every Sunday. Every Sunday at 11 o'clock a.m. We are just so pleased so proud to have you join us today. And you may wonder, what is the gospel truth uh, uh, based on? First of all, Reverend Lundy, just say hello to our, to our listening audience and our guests. Say hello to them, please. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the gospel truth. Glad to see you here again today. Amen. You may you may wonder, uh, what, what is the gospel truth uh, based on? What is the gospel truth? Well. The foundation scripture for the gospel truth is found in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, which teach us the following points. Moreover, moreover brethren, I declare unto you, which I declare to you, amen, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you receive and in which you stand by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word, I preach to you unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. And that is, in fact, the gospel, the gospel as we know it. The gospel truth that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he, he came down through 42 generations. Amen. And he served as the propitiation, the sacrifice, the atonement, the covering of our sins uh, so that we might inherit the right to eternal life as human beings. After his death, Jesus Christ was put into a borrowed tomb. And that he stayed there for three days and three nights. And while he was there, he went down into Hades, snatched the keys of death, took the sting out of, took the sting out of death, and on the third day resurrected into the newness of life where he ascended to God the Father, carrying with him the blood, the atonement for our sins. That's why uh, the Bible teaches us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Jesus Christ's own pure blood removed the first covenant. That covenant no longer existed where we needed to have bulls, goats, lambs, turtle doves, and pigeons sacrificed 
for man's sin, to atone for man's sin. But according to the book of Hebrews chapter 9, when Jesus Christ took the blood that he shed on the cross into the, the throne room of God the Father Almighty and presented that pure blood to God, it served as the perpetuation, the atonement for our sins. All mankind, whosoever would believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and all you have to do is just profess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he died for your sins and my sins, and you will be saved and brought into eternity. There are many people who teach many different doctrines. And I rest on the fact of when people say that they're spiritual, I ask the question, what is spirituality? Who's in charge of it? I never heard anyone say that there's someone in charge of spirituality or that when they pray, who are they praying to? The air, the sun, the moon, the rocks? No, my brothers and sisters, we as Christians believe that Jesus Christ, we have a name that is associated with our ministry. The book of Acts declares that there is no other name in heaven whereby you must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. And that's why we bring to you every Sunday at 11 o'clock worldwide to our friends that are in Africa, Canada, California, wherever you are, we are in fact bringing you the gospel truth as we do on Fridays, three o'clock p.m. Eastern time and eight o'clock in Nigeria time. We bring you this gospel, not because we don't have other things to do, but because we recognize our mission and our service to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We recognize that people falter in their lives because they don't have enough information to know that Jesus saves and that Jesus can fulfill the empty void in your life. Recently on uh, last Sunday, we saw a very tragic event that occurred on uh, the, Academy, the 94th Academy Award ceremony, in which one of our esteemed actors, uh, Will Smith, went up on the stage and slapped horrendously Chris Rock for telling a G.I. Jane joke I looked inside of uh, Will Smith's eyes and his eyes were empty as though there was a void. The Bible teaches us about depravity, moral corruption and wickedness. And to attest to the event that took place that night, Denzel Washington, one, another one of our acclaimed actors, uh, put it in context, at the moment of the height of your success, Satan will come and try to steal, kill, and destroy and rob you of the victory that God has given to you. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because we want you to know that your faith matters and we are asking you to activate your faith. And my brothers and sisters, this is uh, the theme, the subject of what our esteemed speaker, teacher, preacher today, Reverend Harry E. Lundy, is going to speak about in his message today. And so we're very happy uh, to present him in the fullness of joy, a man that got married last week, has a new bride, but yet he considered it not robbery to come and to present the gospel of Jesus Christ on this Sunday morning. Reverend Harry E. Lundy is a retired uh, civil servant and indeed uh, having served his country in the US military, has worked in the prison ministries uh, throughout the nation's capital and beyond, has preached and taught the gospel to thousands. He's a man of God. He's a man of dignity. He is a man that believes in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he served at Galilee Baptist Church for a number of years in, uh, in Maryland. And now he's associated and serves as assistant to the pastor, Servants for Christ Baptist Church. My brothers and sisters, we are very happy and pleased to present to you today our good friend, I would say a lifelong friend, 
because that's how I feel about him. My brother, I call him my big brother. My, my, one of my best friends and a very dignified and intelligent man, Reverend Harry E. Lundy, assistant to the pastor. But he's also our social media pastor because he comes and he preaches and he delivers the word of God with vigor, with power and purpose. Today, he's going to speak to us on a subject. Trouble don't last always. For those of you that have your Bibles, we're asking you to turn to the book of Ruth, chapter one, verses one through five, as I pray for him. Lord, we thank you for Reverend Harry E. Lundy. Thank you for his new wedding, and we ask your blessings upon it in the name of Jesus to consecrate him and his bride, Mrs. Lundy, that they will have the fulfillment of joys in their life, and that you will guide their path as they enter into the new matrimony that they, Lord, will help and assist each other. And you told us in your word, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. I pray the blessings upon Mr. and Mrs. Lundy in their new marriage, and that you will fulfill the purpose that you have for their lives in the name of Jesus. Bless him as he brings forth the word of God today on the gospel truth. Amen, amen. May God bless you. Reverend Lundy, uh, we know what you're gonna talk about today and uh, we're, we're standing on tippy toes waiting to hear what you have to say. May God bless you, sir. Please go ahead and proceed with your message for today. And God bless you. Thank you so much, Reverend Jones. I wanna give honor to God and to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, and to each one of you. And to each one of the listeners out there, may God bless you. Welcome this morning to the Gospel Truth. Without further ado, if you would turn with me to the book of Ruth, uh, chapter one, verses one through five. And it reads like this. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elamelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth, and they dwelt there about 10 years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. So the women, the woman, survived her two sons and her husband. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, I come before your throne of grace to thank you and to ask for your help in bringing forth your word that they may hear your word and apply to their lives and accept your son, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior. We thank you, Lord, for all you have done for us and continue to do for us. Bless this message and bless the hearers of the message and that they may 
be able to say when that time come that they fought the good fight, that they finished the race, that they kept the faith. In Jesus' name, I say this prayer. Amen and amen. So it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land of Bethlehem, Judah. And usually when there's a famine, it's because uh, someone has sinned and, and God may be issuing discipline. And this probably, this is the case here. This is the case here with Israel. Because of it, Elamelech, Naomi, and family left their country for another country. They ran out of bread in Bethlehem, Judah, because a famine struck the land. And I find that very strange because Bethlehem means house of bread. The house of bread had ran out of bread. But man does not live by bread alone. This is not to say that man does not live by bread at all, but just that he does not live by it alone. However, we do live by every word that comes from the mouth of God, whether we know that or not. This family did not exercise patience and decided to move out, hoping to leave trouble behind. But trouble do not last always. The Book of Ruth give us a realistic portrait of life with its tragedies and frustrations. I put my trust in God and always like to see how God worked things out. It is always very exciting and intriguing to know and to see how God worked things out. When the Egyptians had the Jews back against the Red Sea and they proceeded to attack, far from my thoughts was God opening up the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And they proceeded to go across on dry land. Then closing the sea behind Pharaoh and his army when they decided to come after the Jews. I would never have thought of anything like that. I would perhaps think that maybe God will strike them down with lightning or something, but opening up the Red Sea and allowing the Israelites to cross through is amazing really astonishing and it and it counts to his glory we identify with tragedy and frustrations in our lives today when the pandemic struck there was no country safe to run to so we had to stay put naomi the mother-in-law of ruth met with so much tragedy and frustration that she wanted to change her name from Naomi, which means pleasant, or my delight or delight, which means pleasant and so forth, to Mara, which means bitter, the bitter one. Her family left the land that God had blessed them with, Israel. Her husband and two sons lived in 
Bethlehem, Judah. Bethlehem means the house of bread and, and Judah means praise. A famine struck. Every time a famine is mentioned in the word of God, it is a judgment from God. This is terrible. Naomi's family responded as if they did not believe God will take care of them in the house of bread and of praise. That is what Bethlehem and Judah mean. So they ran off to the land of Moab. Does this not indicate a lack of faith? It is impossible to please God without faith. Those of us that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently Seek him. Are you seeking God? Are you seeking to follow his son, Jesus? In the days when the judges ruled, there were bad and terrible times where the Jews, the Israelites, the chosen people of God, turned their backs on God. What is America doing today? Is America following Jesus or seeking God's will for their lives, for their country? There was corruption, compromise, and confusion. There were lots of sin being exercised by the Jews by God's people. That's what they were called. God said, I will punish them for their sin. Exodus 32 and 34. Israel would worship false gods alongside the true God. Our true God said, there will be no strange gods before him. What went wrong? There is a condition to God's promised blessings. If the Israelites remain faithful in obedience to the covenant given at Sinai, God will give them success and victory. God alone was responsible for Israel's existence and everything else. But he chose them, therefore he alone deserved Israel's worship, adoration, and obedience. Christ alone is responsible for our redemption, no one else. Therefore he alone deserves our submission, adoration, obedience, and worship. God the Father sent him, God the Son. Trouble don't last always, but Naomi said, change my name to Mara. Tragedy struck her in Moab. Her husband passed away there. His sons, Malon and Chilion, married Moabite women. Their names meant, respectively, sickly and puny. Malon, sickly. Chilion, puny were the meanings of their names. Malon married Ruth, and Chilion married Orpa. Malon and Chilion died 
in Moab too. They died also. The famine did not come to an end in Bethlehem until after 10 years. And Naomi decided to return home as Mara, the bitter one. Naomi proceeded to return to Bethlehem, Judah, but Orpah did not really accept Naomi's God and she went back worshiping false gods with her people. Ruth, on the other hand, had decided to return with Naomi. She accepted Naomi's God. Orpah made a bad decision for her God was not real. Ruth made a decision for God, and when she made this decision, it was for time and eternity. Ruth is here repenting. She is turning away from her old life of worshiping idols for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death, 2 Corinthians 7 and 10. The book of Ruth underscores an overarching scheme of the Bible. God desires all to believe in him, even non-Israelites. This was God's plan from the beginning. He had covenanted with Abraham and his descendants in order to bless other nations through the Israelites and draw all nations to himself. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Have you repented? What does repentance mean? It's a change of mind, not about individual plans, intentions, or beliefs, but rather a change in the whole personality from a sinful course of action to God. Repentance is such an important aspect of conversion that it is often stressed rather than saving faith. As when Christ said that there is joy in heaven among the angels over one sinner that repents. Luke 15 and 7. But repentance is the sign that I realize what God has done through Christ. Repentance is the effort or the effect of what God done through Jesus Christ. It is not the cause. Repentance is a sign that I realize what God has done for me, for us, through Jesus. Naomi was a God-fearing woman. And both daughters-in-law loved her, and she loved them. Her life evidently allowed both daughters-in-law to see their sinful direction. And one did not think it that important and went back to her false gods and the broad road that leads to destruction. Is it possible for a person to be unable to believe the gospel? This is possible. In John 12, 39, it is declared of certain people that they could not believe 
And the reason given is in the words quoted from Isaiah 6. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and be converted. And I should heal them. It is tragically possible for people to trifle with God and the word of God so that their hearts become hardened and they are unable to believe. The word of God itself, unless it is believed and obeyed, becomes a snare. And through it, the human heart becomes hard and callous. The only true justice comes from God. Folk promise God many things and do not carry through with it. But Ruth, Ruth made some promises. One, Ruth said to Naomi, where you go, I will go. Make a real decision for God. Two, Ruth said, I made a decision to go with you to Naomi. And I am going with you. I am not using this as a passport to get into your land. Ruth said to Naomi, where you live, I will live. In other words, I will identify with you. I accept your poverty. Your people shall be my people. I am forsaking my people and their idols and identifying myself with God's people. We cannot make a decision for God unless we identify with his people. You say I will be an outcast, all right? But your people will be my people anyhow, said Ruth. Your God will be my God. And where you die, I will die. Where you are buried, I will be buried, said Ruth to Naomi. Let the Lord deal with me ever so severely if anything other than death separates us. Some very strong words, very strong commitment. The idea of loyalty is evident in this book, loyal love. The Hebrew word trans, translated as kindly in verse 1, verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8, means loyal love or covenantal love. This was a genuine love that keeps promises. When the word is used of God, it refers to God's loving faithfulness to his promises. Even though Ruth was a foreigner and was not familiar with God's law, she displayed this type of love and loyalty to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Your desire, your desire should be to get closer to God. And you cannot do this without Jesus. 
Here, a plan is being made for Jesus to come to this earth. Not only can you get closer to God through and by Jesus, but Jesus has prayed that you become one with him as he is one with his father. He prayed that prayer in chapter 17 of John. John's gospel. In Moab, Naomi prayed to the one true God, the God of Israel. Geography is no barrier to prayer. Jesus mentioned that to the woman at the well. Naomi expressed in the prayer conversation with her daughter-in-laws. God controls all life and history. He uses human suffering and misfortune to accomplish his purposes. At times we cannot say such misfortune is divine punishment for personal sin, we have no explanation for it. Instead, we have to accept our situation as being under God's control, including this COVID-19 pandemic. We can weigh our alternatives prayerfully and reasonably and act in time, we may discover how God is working even through our afflictions. In the midst of trouble, which doesn't last always, we can confess that God is at work in our lives and that we do not understand what is happening. Having passed through suffering, we may find other explanations for this dark side of life. The whole world witnessed a, a act of many people liked both walk up on the stage and slap another actor that many people liked. Something happened. for that to happen. And we know it involves Satan. We will at least confess that God is good and what he does cannot ultimately be called evil. Naomi was feeling so bad about herself, she said to both of her daughter-in-laws, or daughters-in-laws, return to your mother's house. She tried to convince them to turn back that she does not have any more sons that either one of them could marry. She felt that the hand of the Lord had come against her. She mentioned to them that if she did find another husband and had some sons, would they be willing to wait for our sons to grow up? Verse 14. Said they lifted up their voices and wept. And Oprah kissed Naomi, mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Ruth refused to leave Naomi as Oprah turned back to go back to her people who worship idols. There is a history between Moab and Israel. 
They were enemies. And Moabites were forbidden to enter Israel. Back during Israel's wandering in the wilderness before they cross the Jordan, the Israelites encamped in the plains of Moab. That's Numbers 22 and 1 and Joshua 3 and 1. Moab was the name of one of Lot's two sons. And the Moabites are descendants of Lot. During Israel's encampment, Moabites and Midianite women came or were sent to seduce the Israelite men so that they participated in idolatrous behavior, thus angering God. 24,000 died in the plague that fell upon those participating in sinning against God. This and other run-ins the Israelites and Moabites had with each other resulted in Moabites being barred from entering Israel. Naomi determines to return to Bethlehem, Judah. Orpah stays behind in Moab while Ruth steadfastly follows Naomi. Naomi left Israel with a husband and two sons. Now she returns with herself and a Moabite daughter-in-law. Naomi was selling the family's inheritance as there was no male heirs. Her husband and two sons were dead. Unless a redeeming relative repurchase the land, Naomi's land, would be owned by another family. Israel had this strange liberate marriage law. This law would require that the relative purchasing the land would have to marry the widow. And the children from that marriage would belong to the widow's deceased husband. Strange law. A relative did come forward and wanted to buy the land. But marrying the widow, Ruth, was not beneficial to him. So he declined. And along came Boaz, the next in line relative. You know how that story went. Trouble does not last always. You see, God gave Israel a deliverer. Not just once, but many times when they got themselves in trouble. When his chosen, the children of Israel, cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel. Their troubles did not last always. Job's troubles did not last always. David's troubles did not last always. Ruth had no reason to believe she, she would fare well in the land of Israel 
in light of the fact of what the Moabites had done to Israel during their wilderness journey. Moabites were so hated that Jews were forbidden even to seek their peace or their prosperity. Deuteronomy 23 and 6. As a matter of fact, Israel had a law that stated no Moabite could enter the assembly of the Lord. It stated, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly. An Ammonite. Ammon is another son of Lot that were against Israel. And so the Ammonites are descendants of Lot as well. So an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter their assembly of the Lord to the 10th generation, this creed said, none of their descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever because they did not meet the Jews with bread and water on the road when they came out of Egypt. And because the Moabites hired Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse the Jews. But God turned that curse into a blessing. Balaam ended up blessing the Jews. Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, heard about this widow, Ruth, the daughter-in-law of Naomi. He observed Ruth's behavior in the fields, gleaming. Uh, that's where we learn how to gleam. Gleaming means if, if you have a crop grown and you go out and do the harvesting, whatever you leave behind, you let the poor come and get it. It's not customary for you to go back and harvest the land again. Just harvest it once. And whatever left behind, you allow the poor to get. And Ruth was poor and went to glean in the fields that belonged to Boaz. And so Boaz observed Ruth, how, how she acted and how she treated her mother-in-law. He recognized that Ruth feared the Lord. As a result, he made up his mind to extend grace toward her, despite her Moabite background. You know how the story went. It was the unfolding of God's plan to send the ultimate deliverer. Mm-hmm a deliverer to deliver all of mankind. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Despair may be the only response we can give in the hour of tragedy. Despair is not the end of faith. Naomi became bitter, but God continued to work to bless her. He will do the same for us, helping us work our way through despair to faith in his redemption. As things turn out all along, God was working his plan using an unknown widow from a foreign nation to produce a king for his people as they had judges 
and was asking to have a king like all the other nations. Israel was asking for a king because all they had were judges. And God was working it out. Check this out. The meaning of Naomi's husband's name, Elimelech, it means God is my king. Isn't that strange? Elimelech name means God is my king, and here he is leaving the land to dodge the famine. At a time the judges rule and the Jews were asking for a king here, God is my king is Naomi's husband's name. All that transpired in the book of Ruth was not a coincidence or happened by accident. It was God at work. Similarly to the prophecy of Jesus' birth taking place in Bethlehem, Judah. Here is Mary pregnant, about to give birth, and she is living in Nazareth, a significant amount of miles away from Bethlehem. It was prophesied that Jesus, the, the Son of God, will be born in Bethlehem, but here Mary who is carrying the baby Jesus is living in Nazareth, far away from Bethlehem, about to give birth. It's not, it didn't seem in the eyes of humans likely that this could ever happen. She at that time had no reason to go to Bethlehem. Then a decree came out from Caesar Augustus that all must register. And the registering must be done at the place where folk were born. And Mary and Joseph was born in Bethlehem. So now they got reason to go to Bethlehem. Both Mary and Joseph, they had to go there to register. When they went there, Jesus was born there as prophesied. When that did not, when that did not seem possible, it happens. God works in strange ways to us. Brothers and sisters, God can be trusted in the darkest hour. We need not seek escape from tragedy to a new place of opportunity. We need, we need rather to see God's presence and wait for him to reveal his grace and fulfill his promises. He who waits on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We should come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need, amen. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we come before your throne of grace, not understanding perfectly and not knowing the reason why for many things, almighty God, we come to you with our trust because it was you that made us. 
and know all about us. So Father, we ask that you continue to guide us and lead us the way we should go. You say in your word that we should know that all things work together for good to them who love you, to them who are the call according to your purpose. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do and all that you purpose to do. Giving you all honor and all glory for which you so richly deserve. Strengthen us, Father. Enable us to resist all temptations that comes. All temptation comes from the evil one. Strengthen us to resist it, Father and for us to always look to you for our guidance, for our help, for our answers. It's in Jesus' name that I pray this prayer. We thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Amen, amen, and amen. We praise God for that uh, powerful exposition on the story of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. That is a powerful, powerful story, and it speaks to the essence of God's love, as you pointed out in this message today, uh, Reverend Harry E. Lundy. That served as a precursor to the redeeming grace that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ provided for us. That as uh, that as Naomi in Ruth's story was seen as an act of kindness, an act of love, and an act of grace. God showed mercy upon Ruth the same way that he shows his grace and his mercy, mercy uh, toward each one of us for humbling ourselves and submitting our lives in submission to the ordinances, the statutes, and the commands of God. You know, God watches everything that we do. He hears everything that we say. God said that in the book of Matthew chapter 28, around the 18th and 20th verses, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. The things that you discussed today, Reverend Lundy, on the, the glory of God, essentially, of how Boaz stepped in to save Ruth, is the same way that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ stepped in to save us with his redeeming love. By coming to serve as the perpetuation, the atonement, to sacrifice his life by dying on the cross at Calvary so that you and I could have the right to his eternal kingdom. The only thing that God asks us to do is to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives, that we may inherit life. I'm begging and pleading to all of you under the sound of our voices today, Reverend Harry E. Lundy and Jerry Jones. We're begging you to put aside all your differences that you may have had with God. Understand that there is an enemy out there that is coming for you, coming for your life, coming for your family, <clears throat> coming for your prosperity, coming for your heritage. But there's also God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that is bringing you life, 
bringing you life more abundantly, bringing you life that you might enjoy the pleasures of the abundant giving of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that your life and your purpose may be fulfilled. And so, my brothers and sisters, if you are unchurched, if you are unsaved, we need you. We need you to join Servants for Christ Baptist Church, 713 Katy Drive in Fort Washington, Maryland. If your life is filled with emptiness, uncertainty, if you need to learn more about the word of God, we provide that opportunity to learn and empower your life as a life full with meaning and purpose through the teaching of the word of God. I need you to come to 713 Katy Drive in Fort Washington, Maryland, the C-A-D-Y, Katy Drive in Fort Washington, Maryland, and experience the fulfillment of learning more about the word of God. Yes, we stand ready to serve you. And if you're unable to physically come to 713 KD Drive in Fort Washington, Maryland, at nine o'clock each Sunday morning, we also produce a live Facebook broadcast as well as a live television broadcast that is shown on CTV television in Prince George's County, Maryland. And it is also shown on DC TV in Washington, DC. Followed by this live broadcast on Zoom and Facebook at 11 o'clock each Sunday morning with Yes, my brothers and sisters, we are asking you to join us. We need you to join in with us. In addition to our worldwide broadcast each Friday at 3 o'clock p.m. East Coast time and 8 o'clock p.m. Nigeria time, when we are joined by Bishop Martin King of the King International Church in Nigeria. We'll be right back after our exit, and Reverend Harry E. Lundy is going to give us our charge and some concluding thoughts on this message that he delivered with such power today. Trouble don't last always. My mother used to sing the song, There's a Bright Side Somewhere. There is a bright side somewhere. So we ask God to, to richly bless you and keep you in his care. And God bless you. Thank you for viewing our broadcast. Please visit our Facebook page, Servants for Christ Baptist Church, or our YouTube page, search Servants for Christ Baptist Church. To join as a virtual member or to support our ministry, please visit ServantsForChristInc.org. Our pastor's love offering cash app is dollar sign Dr. Jerry Jones. Our church office is 240-244-2564. For prayer requests, our number is 240-241-0849. And our email is sfcbcministries at gmail.com. Sufficient for me. Our church theme is Transform Yourself, and it comes from Revelation chapter 21, verse 5. Please come visit us. You are always welcome at Servants for Christ Baptist Church. We are located at 713 Katy Drive, Fort Washington, Maryland, 20744. The Little Church with the Big Heart, where our pastor is the Reverend Dr. Jerry W. Jones, Jr. We hope to see you soon. Many blessings to each of you. Bye-bye.
lift your hands if you know you think about his grace. Oh, the world says live for today. You can do the thing. Yes, my brothers and sisters, we want to uh, thank you for joining us again today. Reverend Harry Lundy is now going to close us out with the, his final thoughts and the benediction. May God bless you. A lot of times we forget our position with God. And we know that when we sin, God punishes sin. And when we do wrong, you know, God disciplines us. And even back then with Naomi and her husband, um, they forgot, like many of us, they forgot about faith. They were walking by sight and not by faith. So when the famine came, they looking at it, not with faith, but by sight. If, you know, and so they left the country. And even, even uh, Abraham made that mistake. When famine came, he was walking by sight and not by faith. And he fled to Egypt. Let us be able to wait upon the Lord and walk by faith. And he says, he who waits upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They should mount up on wings like eagles. They should run and not be weary. They should walk and not faint. Let us hold to that. Let us have faith. Let us wait on the Lord. Let us put all of our trust in the Lord. He gave us Jesus. And that's who we should be following. Amen. Let us have a benediction. Bow heads. May the grace of God and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in us both now and forevermore. And let the church say amen and amen. And be amen. 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 Folks, we'll see you next Sunday at 11 o'clock a.m. for more of the gospel truth. On behalf of Reverend Lundy, I am Jerry Jones. We bid you good day. Thank you.